Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. Karen would not move her car, so I made her cry. After that, you want your forgery documents sent to court? Sure. And after that, am I the jerk for getting mad that my parents haggled over my birthday gift? Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen cries. <laughs> So please smash that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. Karen would not move her car, so I made her cry. My dad drove me, 30 male, to the train station earlier today. And when he dropped me off, he parked in a disabled spot. He is disabled with a blue badge, but you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell just by looking. I could see my dad's car from where I was waiting for the train and noticed he hadn't moved for a minute. On checking, it was because this man and woman, both in their 50s or 60s, were going back and forth, unloading some gardening supplies and they had parked behind blocking men. Assuming they didn't realize he was wanting to get out of the space, and dad's completely non-confrontational so wouldn't say anything, I asked them to move. The guy said, We're only going to take a few minutes so he can wait. I responded, That doesn't really work as they're blocking someone in who needs to leave. The guy's response was, Well, you're clearly not disabled, and he doesn't look disabled either, so it doesn't matter if I'm blocking your disabled spot. Before he walked back to get the next bag from his car. This really ticked me off, and is the first instance of seeing someone in person not respecting a disability. Plus, it's my dad, so it hits close to home. The woman then came with a bag, and I repeated the request to move, and she said that we can wait, and it's not a real spot they're blocking, which didn't really make any sense. At that point, I was pretty annoyed and told them it doesn't matter if they're going to be 30 seconds or 10 minutes, they're blocking a disabled spot. And also, it doesn't matter if you can see the disability or not. If someone is in the spot, then assume they're disabled. She responded that she doesn't want to have this conversation with me, but made no effort to move the car. So I said a bit more angrily that I don't care if she wants to talk or not. They need to move their car as they're blocking a disabled person. And whether they see it or not, the disability is real. The woman then goes, I know disabilities. I work with disabled people. I quickly shot back. Well, I feel sorry for the people you work with, as you clearly have no idea and you aren't capable of doing that job. Finally, the guy walks off and moves the car. Dad leaves and the woman looks like she's about to cry. So I walk back to wait for my train. Wondering if I'm the jerk, as my reaction was more emotional and a ticked off 30 year old guy saying something like this to an older lady who didn't want to engage in conversation may have been scary for her. Not that I was in any way threatening, but I feel it was deserved. Info, as there's been a couple of similar comments, this might be helpful. My dad did get out of the car and didn't just drop me off. He pulled in and got out of the car to say goodbye, a hug, etc. and would have struggled to get out of a normal car parking space as it's too tight and issues with movement. I think he had originally planned to come to the platform with me, but I told him not to worry about coming all the way. There was an area he could have pulled into to just drop me off, but as he was getting out, the space was more appropriate. Also, there was another free disabled space to the side, so him being there wasn't preventing another disabled person from parking at that time. You want your forgery document sent to court? <laughs> sure. I work at a translation office. Our job is basically to translate official documents work certificates, academic degrees, medical papers, etc. to be used in other countries. The whole service is controlled and monitored by the judiciary and we are basically under their direct supervision. My boss had to be directly certified by the court. Some countries also require our translation to be double certified by the local court and or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's pretty routine work most of the time, but since these are official documents, there are a lot of rules we have to follow like what documents can be issued at official translation and how much we are allowed to charge, down to the smallest pennies. My boss is usually a super cool guy and does all he can to help people who come in, sometimes even refusing pay from people who can't afford it even though he still has to pay the tax for the income since it gets registered in the system. Now, this is actually something my boss did. I fully agreed with him, but it wasn't my call to make. Last week, some guy, let's call him Mr. X, comes in and brings us a bunch of documents to translate, including work certificates, his academic diploma, and transcript of his grades, and some other stuff. He brought them in two batches 
so by the time we received the second set of documents, his first was already translated and double certified by the court and Ministry of Foreign Affairs. His grade transcripts were in the first batch, his diploma was in the second batch. This will be important later. At first, he refused to give us his diploma, saying that his mother had hidden the document to prevent him from traveling abroad. Not the strangest thing we've heard, so whatever, but we kindly inform him that we are not allowed to issue a translation of copies and have to at least see the original document. So does the court and the ministry. So he goes and gets it a couple of days later. Now, as I was the one in charge of his translations, and the moment I picked up his diploma, something felt off. It was too heavy. I actually had to check several times to make sure it wasn't two or three documents stuck together. A closer examination showed that a post stamp attached to the back was not real, but instead a copy. Strange. I call my boss, since now I'm sure this is a forgery. He comes, checks the document, but it's really strange. These documents have foreign prevention measures like holograms, UV light sensitive prints, and most of them are in order except the stamp in the back and the fact that the photocopy looks strange. At this point, I just suggested calling the cops and letting them deal with it, but my boss, the good guy that he is, didn't want to get the guy in trouble and said he wasn't 100% sure, more like 90% sure. So he had someone bring it to the court to check, but instructed that person to be discreet, get their opinion, and get out with document, not leave it there as evidence. So they did just that. Within the hour, the document was back in our hands with a suggestion from the court official that we probably should treat it as a forgery. Hearing that, my boss decides to get the fake diploma to the guy and send him away, as long as he brings us the translation we issued for his grade transcripts, which was for the same course as the diploma, so it was probably fake. He even offered to pay back the money he paid just to get the translation to us, get your things, and go be a criminal somewhere else. Pretty lenient if you ask me, but it's his business, not mine. The next day, we get a call from the local court asking us why we are refusing to send the document belonging to Mr. X to the court to be certified. Turns out, the guy had gone to court and filed a complaint against us because we refused to do his work. So now, my boss is upset and does just as Mr. X wanted, sends the forged diploma to the court. They, of course, immediately can tell it's a forgery. They seized it open an investigation against Mr. X, and now he is on the hook for multiple crimes, some of them with serious jail time. The court also asked us to give them the serial number for all of the documents ever translated under this guy's name. Everything, including ID documents, work certificates, everything, so that they can contact all embassies and warn them about the possibility of forgery, which probably means the guy will be blacklisted in every country that matters. My boss made some excuse at first about not having all the serial numbers ready, but then Mr. X came in Monday with his father and issued some strange threats. So the next workday, all the serial numbers were at court. We also didn't have to pay his money back. And to think, had he just done his ass, he wouldn't have been on the hook for so many crimes and he would also have received a full refund. I would still call the police personally, but I have to admit, this was more entertaining. Am I the jerk for getting mad that my parents haggled over my birthday gift? I'm 28, female, and my parents, dad, 62, mom, 60, always get my brother, who's 26, better gifts than me. For example, last Christmas, they got him a brand new gaming laptop while I got a couple of books and some premark clothes. The difference was so stark that even my mom pointed out that my gifts had been so much cheaper. But don't worry, she made up for it by buying me a magazine. A kid's magazine. Yeah. This has been happening since we were kids. It even happened when my brother was making twice as much money as me. For some reason, they dote on him, but give me cheap gifts. My brother has noticed it too and feels guilty about it. He suggested that this year, instead of leaving it up to them, I buy something for myself and then ask them to pay for it. He does that most years. So after making sure my parents were okay with it, I did exactly that. I got myself a pair of off-brand AirPods. They were cheaper than the gift my parents got for my brother's birthday this year, but whatever, it's not about money. It's about getting something that is useful and that makes me happy. Yesterday was my birthday. I opened my brother's present, a book I had been eyeing for a while. He's the best. And then retrieved the AirPods from my bedroom. I gently reminded my parents that they hadn't paid for them yet. And then things got weird. 
first, they kept insisting that they already had paid me. I had to show them my banking app before they believed me. Why the heck would I lie about that when I've always been nothing but honest to them? Then, when I finally convinced them that they hadn't paid for it, they tried to haggle with me. They only wanted to pay for part of the gift rather than the whole thing, as they had done with my brother's more expensive gift. And they started arguing with each other about how much they should pay. One of them would name a number, and then the other one would name a smaller number, and so on. I found the entire thing so hurtful and offensive that I got teary-eyed. I excused myself and locked myself in the bathroom to cry. When I came out of the bathroom, they clearly felt bad. They told me they'd pay for the whole thing after all, but I left soon after. I was too hurt to stay. I know that what matters is the intent behind a gift rather than the price of it, but it really doesn't feel like the intent behind this gift was to make me feel loved. Am I the jerk for leaving before the birthday party was over? I walked out of my hotel three days ago and now a significant portion of the staff has quit. I worked as head housekeeper at a small hotel with five housekeepers, five front desk people, one laundry, and one janitor. I've been there for two years and saw five general managers cycle through. A couple weeks ago, the company hired a new GM and assistant GM. Immediately, the new GM demanded I assign more rooms to the housekeepers every day, regardless of how many arrivals we had that day. In my years there, corporate has had no issue with the housekeepers rolling dirty rooms for the next day but the new GM and AGM immediately started talking about expectations and reputation. I told my GM that working at that hotel sucks and that if it gets any less convenient, people will leave. Three days ago, we had 80 checkouts between the five of us. There were 13 rooms assigned per person, six total check-ins, and nine rolled rooms. The AGM demanded the housekeepers clean the nine rolled rooms. When the housekeeping team learned of this, we all walked down to her office and tried to appeal to her reasonable side. We had had over 50 clean vacant rooms by the end of the day, so what harm will Rolling Nine do? She was aggressive, dismissive, and disrespectful, interrupting everybody who voiced their concerns. This was the final straw. We've needed new vacuums for over a year. The housekeepers have been expected to pick up the slack of laundry, janitor, and breakfast since lockdown started. They took our lockdown hazard pay away after one month. I spent an hour in the dirty room I was working on, fuming with anger. Finally, I walked to my cart and picked up a single die sitting on it. If it rolls even, I'll stay. If it rolls odd, I'll walk out. I rolled a one. I said goodbye to all my coworkers and pleaded with them to not let themselves be exploited. Then I walked down to the front desk where the AGM was working. The exchange went as follows. Me. Hi. Do you know how to roll rooms on the computer? AGM. Yes, I do. Good. Can you roll these 12 rooms? I'm leaving. Okay. Hey, at least I got my single arrival done. Fast forward to today, when my friend slash former coworker messaged me. One of the remaining housekeepers put her two weeks in. She gives her friend, another housekeeper, a ride to work every morning, so she will likely quit as well. One of the front desk girls walked out, and another put her two weeks in. One of the guys at the desk has been talking about leaving too. Two of my friends are housekeepers and they will be making demands to our new GM because she is absolutely done for if anyone else quits. Nobody wants to be a housekeeper at our hotel. The college kids in town can't do it because of the shift and all of the other young people are making pizza for less work and more money. I'm not going to lie, this is incredibly satisfying. I've wanted to leave that place for a year and I fantasized about quitting and starting a chain reaction. It's finally happened and I feel like a little bit of justice has been administered against a company that's proven over and over that they don't care about their workers. Edit. They just fired one of my friends, and I'm guessing the other will either be fired too or walk out. He said the two of us were the only thing keeping him there. Edit 2. My other friend has been fired. They are down to two housekeepers. Edit 3. My friend talked to one of the front desk ladies who hasn't put in her notice yet after he got fired, and she said my friends and I were the only things keeping her there. She's most likely going to leave too, which would make the toll four housekeepers and three front desk workers. Am I the jerk for not letting my husband go on a postponed bachelor party trip? One of my husband's closest friends got married in a courthouse ceremony last year. They debated postponing their entire ceremony, but decided to just do a courthouse wedding to save money. They threw a smallish reception-like party in their backyard to celebrate with friends and family instead. Since they also both had to cancel their bachelor and bachelorette parties, they decided to use some of the money they saved from the wedding to go on trips with their friends. 
my husband's friend decided he wanted to go to Vegas. He sent out an email to everyone invited detailing the trip. His friend would book and pay for an entire villa suite, so the only thing the attendees would have to pay for would be airfare and spending cash. When my husband told me about it, he was so excited as he's never been to Vegas and this seemed like the perfect trip since his friend was covering a huge expense. However, we have two kids at home, a three-year-old and a six-week newborn. The trip is in six weeks and my husband's friend wants for sure answers on who is going by the end of this week so he can finalize reservations. I told my husband I don't want him to go because I need his help at home. He pretty much begged me, but I did not give in. I do not think I can handle the needs of both kids by myself. Neither of us has family nearby, and I'm pretty much estranged from all of my family anyway. The only real option we have for help is his mom, and she lives 3,000 miles away. He offered to pay for her to come stay to help, but I told him we can't afford it, which he should know. I was also upset that he thought he had the money to pay for this at all. We have two kids. We shouldn't be spending our money on gambling party trips. I pretty much put my foot down and told my husband he can't go and that there's nothing he can do to convince me that he should or that it's even an idea worth entertaining. He's still been trying to convince me and come up with ideas that he thinks will make it work, no matter how many times I tell him to stop. I finally snapped at him and told him to drop it because he's not going and there's nothing he can do to convince me otherwise. I told him his priority needs to be his family right now, not going off with his friends to blow money on drinks and gambling. He called me a controlling jerk and said that I'm depriving him of a once-in-a-lifetime trip. I told him if he went, he would be missing out on a once-in-a-lifetime moment with his kids, and that's what he needs to focus on. I told him he just needs to drop it and tell his friends he can't go and be done with it. He told me that he hopes I remember this when there's something that I really want to do, because he would never deprive me of an experience like this. He did finally tell his friend he can't go, but now he's barely talking to me, and pretty much only about things related to the kids. I can't even understand why he thought going would be a good idea. But am I the jerk here? Am I the jerk for turning in a group project early and most of my group members getting a zero? That sounds bad, but please read. So in my university psych class, we have these group essay projects where we basically split the topic into parts and each write a part. We had two weeks to do our parts, it's about a paragraph each, and we had already known what parts we were doing, share the documents and everything. It's really not that much work. My part took about 20 minutes, literally. So we're all in a group chat, and after the initial topic selection, no one but one person had said anything or done their part. Just me and this other girl, Jess. So the day it's due comes around, due at 11.59 p.m. And that night was also the football game that my partner and I bought tickets for and were excited to go to for months prior. It didn't start until 8 p.m., so it was very unlikely that I wouldn't be able to be the one to finish anyone who didn't finish his part and turn it in. Only one person needs to turn it in. So I send a message to the group that morning asking if someone else can be responsible for turning it in since I couldn't that night. Only Jess said anything, saying she can't because she's an online student in another country so the time zone would make it so she can't. Totally understandable. I wait a bit and ask again. No response from anyone and they still haven't started their parts. A couple hours from the game and I'm starting to stress because I don't want to have to skip the game we spent 100 plus dollars on, but I couldn't be the one to finish their parts and turn it in if I didn't do it beforehand. So I talk to the TA and she says to me one more time, tell everyone that they need their parts done by the time I leave, 8 p.m., or I'm going to turn it in without their parts. After this, one more person does their part, but the rest still don't. So I do their parts and turn it in, right before I leave at 8 p.m., and made a note of who didn't do their parts as the TA told me to, and turned it in. While I was at the game, the rest of them, I guess, finally saw the message and blew up the chat, losing it on me, saying they're going to get a zero now, and that I turned it in before the due date time so it was unfair. When I saw this, I said how that's what the TA told me to do, and that they had two weeks to write one paragraph, and that I had been asking for 12 hours prior if anyone else can just be the one to turn it in, and no one said anything. If anyone just offered to turn it in, I wouldn't have had to turn it in early at all. They said they're going to talk to the TA and that I'm a try-hard jerk. The TA is on my side, so I'm not going to get in trouble, but am I the jerk? Edit. This keeps getting brought up in the comments, so I'm going to add it here. The professor has also been contacted and he agreed with the TA's judgment. Also, from the beginning, they had the option to turn in their part after I turned in ours at 8pm, but didn't probably should have mentioned that in the original post, but again, 
they had the entire deadline, 11.59 p.m., to get full credit for their part. Oh, how I always despised group projects. You're preaching to the choir, Reddit boy. I despised the teachers who assigned them. Am I the jerk for telling my brother-in-law to leave after he kept handing out his wedding invitations at my wedding? My wife's brother, male 37, and I, male 33. I don't call him brother-in-law for reasons. He's a doctor and takes pride in his line of work and treats others as less than. Admittedly, he's civil enough to be around. He's a dad to a 16-year-old daughter. He's engaged and was supposed to get married last month, but postponed because he had a fight with his father-in-law. He got involved in our wedding by criticizing the rules we had from the food, menu, who should and shouldn't attend according to his prestige, and also started sulking because he wanted his fiance to be maid of honor, but my wife and I didn't agree. Days before this wedding, he came to us and asked if he could announce his wedding date before the ceremony begins, but I politely said no. He said fine and dropped out. At the day of the wedding, he showed up with his fiance and daughter in the middle of the ceremony and didn't even sit. He just started going around shaking guests' hands and handing them small cards, which turned out to be his wedding invitations. I was upset, but couldn't interrupt the ceremony, but obviously people were distracted, which was awful. The ceremony was over, and he was still handing out his wedding invitations and talking about how his wedding will look like from the atmosphere to the venue, etc. Basically, putting my wedding down in every way he could. I walked straight up to him and asked what he was doing. He looked at me from head to toe and started laughing quietly, saying, I'm sorry, my god, that suit, while staring at it. I told him going around handing guests invitations was not acceptable. He said, This wasn't about you. A please don't be offended. Everyone here is family. I told him he was disrespecting my marriage and my wedding and my guests by doing that. He blew up and listed all the things I didn't consider, like letting his fiance be the maid of honor letting his daughter sing with the band or karaoke, and now creating a problem over him handing guests invitations. He then literally asked, How dare you make today all about you? Do you own Wednesday? <laughs> I lost it on him and told him to leave immediately. His fiance and mother-in-law came and tried to get me to drop it, but I told him to leave right then. He was angry and left, then had my in-laws come at me for kicking my wife's brother out in the middle of her wedding and refusing to let him be there and support her. Now I'm expected to make amends and apologize or I won't be invited to his wedding. Well, would you really want to go? Or... Am I the jerk for getting him to leave early and excluding him from the rest of the celebration? So you create a bogus account in my name and refuse to cancel until I pay the account? Okay, sounds like a good plan. My school is getting some work done on the HVAC system and the contractor, hired by the district, not the school, needed some parts to complete the job. The parts vendor arranged to ship the parts to the school and I was asked to meet the courier truck. Not naming names, but it rhymes with dead wrecks. After hours, and put the parts where the contractor would get them the next day. The parts came, the contractor made the fix, the HVAC worked, and all was well. A month later, a bill came from the courier service in the misspelled name of the school. It cited remote access fee of $195 and lift gate fee of $180, add tax, and the invoice totaled over $400. I passed the bill on to our facilities department with instructions to pass it on to the contractor. They did it. It was off my plate and all was well. A month later, a bill came back from the courier service in the misspelled name of the school. It cited remote access fee of $195, lift gate fee $180, and a late payment charge of $30. Add tax and the invoice was over $430. I passed it on to our accounting department, CC'd the facilities department, and asked them to deal with it, and all was well. A month later, a bill came from the courier service. This went on for six months. Facilities didn't want to deal with it. Accounting didn't want to deal with it. The solution was for me to call and try to get the bill canceled. Gritting my teeth, I called their billing department and spent the next 10 minutes arguing with a thoroughly unpleasant collection guy. He explained that due to the difficulty with the delivery location, they opened an account in our name and issued the bill. He grew increasingly belligerent and insisted I pay or he would send it to collections. Despite this being a meaningless threat, I agreed and hung up. I went to my secretary and asked her for a check and the amount of the most recent invoice. I then asked her to open an account in the name of the courier service and created a account disputation fee in the amount of $400 and a telephone argument fee in the amount of $600 and referenced the account number on their invoice. I sent the check to their collections department 
and the invoice to their accounts payable department and all was well. A month later, a letter came from the courier service. They canceled the invoice. Karen demands I edit her music videos without being paid. I end her career instead. I, female 20, have picked up a few skills over the lockdown since there was a lot of staying at home. One of the skills is video editing, like After Effects and Premiere. I had a fair share of hours learning and improving these things and learning from tutorials. Well, a friend of mine heard that I edit, saw a few of my fandom edits, liked them, and wanted me to edit a music video she made. She wanted to send it to one of those music companies and release it. The video was around 3 minutes and 20 seconds long and mostly done outside, so I knew it would take a lot of work correcting everything so it looks pretty. She told me she wanted it done like a fandom edit. I agreed since I cut videos for friends a lot. Well, in the middle, I realized it was way more work than I expected. I think even the first 20 seconds took me about 4 to 5 hours or so. So at some point, I asked her for pay, like 4 euros an hour since I'm not a professional and I was still a lot on the side. She said no, she doesn't have money. I felt the no money part and told her she doesn't have to worry. Well, at some point, I just finished the thing. I felt bad because it was obvious I put more effort into the beginning than in the rest. But I do have a real full-time job, so I sacrificed a few of my weekends for this. She was livid and told me to redo the last part. I agreed to redo the point she wanted. This happened a few more times, then I asked her to go in Discord for me so she can tell me what was wrong. She declines since she doesn't know anything about this stuff. At this point, my boyfriend got to know about all of this and told me to cut it off, discussed it, and in the end, I told her I wouldn't do any more work for her and if she wants something done, she should hire someone professional. She called me crying and told me that I need to finish this. It's the most important thing in her life. I was done with this at this point and hung up. I went to the computer and deleted all versions of the video I had at Dropbox and at my desk since I was so angry. Well, turned out she didn't save any of the video, only the raw cut from the beginning. She tried to reach me through my friend and I said I deleted it and my phone blew up. Messages from Instagram came in insulting me and they even reported my edit account. It's still there luckily, but I was checked from Instagram. I later heard the company wasn't interested in her. My boyfriend said I shouldn't feel bad. My friend said she was crappy, but I shouldn't have deleted everything. And the other said I owe her because I agreed to do it and that I'm the worst. I do realize that I shouldn't have deleted the videos, but I kind of don't feel 100% like the jerk since she didn't save anything. Only maybe 80%. So, am I the jerk? Am I the jerk for saying it's not my problem that some of my friends chose bad husbands and I'm not going to punish mine because of it? To start off, we need to go to the before times, before lockdown times, about 6 or 7 years ago. Right after my husband and I got married, he would always have guys night on Friday night. I'd always have ladies afternoon Saturday afternoon. This continued until we had kids. It didn't stop. No, we just waited a few months until the kids could stand to be away from one parent for half a day, then the other on the next. Yes, both of us kept our day off because my husband is an actual attentive good father and a good husband. Once my lady friends started having kids, they'd join in on our afternoon less and less and more sporadically. Yes, their husbands, well, the ones that had a night, had guys nights still win almost every week though. When the lockdown started, all of them mentioned, in our Zoom chats or text chats, etc., how nice it was to finally have more help around the house. The same thing I've had since day one, but I didn't want to brag, so I mostly kept quiet. Now with the rollout, and over half of my friends, as well as myself and my husband, having got it, everyone is starting to talk about getting back into their normal hangouts, and some have already started. Since many of my friends have gotten used to having an attentive father for their kids for the first time ever, a lot of them are trying to stop everything from going back to normal. So now they are trying, and mostly succeeding, to get our wives group to agree to tell their husbands we all want their guys night out to end, so things won't go back to how they were before. Thing is though, I am 100% against that for my husband. He's a great dad, he deserves a break. He makes sure I get my weekly break too, when it's safe anyway. Plus, I love our mommy only Fridays that I get with my babies just as he does his daddy-only Saturday afternoons. And beyond that, like I said, I already had a good husband and my kids already had an attentive dad. We don't need a lockdown to get things right. 
Even most of the women that have good husbands are agreeing to this to present a unified front, and because some of them don't trust their husbands with a guy's night, even if he is otherwise good. They keep trying to pressure me into joining, but like I said, I like how my life was before lockdown. I like our balance. I like us both getting some downtime. So I kind of snapped. I got sick of their pressuring and said, Look, I get it. You messed up at picking a husband and a father for your kids, and now the only way to get him to be a good one is to force him. I don't have that problem. I actually chose a good guy. He was an A-plus dad and husband long before lockdown. I'm not going to punish him for your mistakes. Most of them are mad at me, but I did get a couple of agreements. It's looking like going forward, my ladies' afternoons are going to be a lot smaller, and frankly, I'm okay with that. But I am worried I may have gone about this the wrong way, or even inadvertently made some lives worse. Edit. I have tried more politely telling them no before. Stuff like, what we have is working for us, and gosh, I'm sorry you feel the need to do that. Guess I'm lucky that I don't. They wouldn't stop pressuring me to change my mind until I snapped. Edit 2. My husband doesn't really hang out with most of my friend's husbands. Sorry, I should have made it clearer. He doesn't want our kids to see him with the type of men who are absent fathers. Huge shout out to our newest official channel member, Jeff. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. It really means the world to Reddit Boy and I. Support the channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. And come watch this video next. You're not going to believe what Karen does in that one.